the adaptation you're getting from a gym works as kind of like an antidote for what you're doing on the track. So it's actually interesting. I'm curious about the mantis you're talking about because when, you know, Goda was in here, right? They're not big fans of the gym and they explain why. And there seems to be good reasoning how it can potentially make an athlete move in a worse way if they're putting lot, lot, like a lot of poundage on their back. And Yeah, just for example, I spent, I spent decades doing squats and you figure there would be some sort of extension. You figure there'd be some sort of follow through with the hips. But when it came to jumping, it was hard for me to demonstrate that. So yeah. there are some parallels where you're like, yeah, well, sometimes training in the gym doesn't always seem like the most beneficial for everybody. Yeah. But for you, you mentioned, and I've heard this from other track athletes I know, specifically college ones that just burn themselves out, um, how they just end up just tearing themselves apart. So you wonder, are you tearing yourself apart because you're not strong enough to handle those forces? How does one build the strength to handle all of the forces you're putting through your body? Well, I think first things first is the recipe. It's the volume and the intensity and the way the program's put together, mm -hmm. right? And if you've got a good program, that's not going to overload you so much that you're going to pull yourself apart. And the, the components are all going to work in synergy and work together and work as antidotes for one another. So let's take heavy lifting, for example. Um, if you do, as a sprinter, 40 squats a week, um, some sprinters will do 40 squats a week and that's it. Mm -hmm. But a good enough intensity to get adaptation stimulus versus how many sprint contacts, like 10,000? How much difference is that going to make to their posture, really? Because the emphasis is on the speed work. Yeah. The gym is supplementary. And then you've got the side of it where the adaptation you're getting from a gym works as kind of like an antidote for what you're doing on the track. And so when you, Just to point out, just quickly, like if it's 40 really shitty reps, then you can say, okay, well, I could see it could probably have detrimental effects. But if it's 40 reps where it's clean and it's with a reasonable percentage, it probably has zero negative impact and probably mostly positive. Yeah, I would say so. And I think the way you see speed athlete squat is slightly different. I mean, and I'm not talking about range of movement here. I'm talking about probably the top end of the movement. Mm -hmm. Most of them will be really explosive to the top. Yeah. And they'll also sometimes add bands and mm -hmm. make it more ballistic, or at least go through the range of motion, work lower full range, and then move to higher range of motion um, squat, top range of motion squats. So yeah, they kind of work in hip extension more. So in my experience, track coaches will drill hip extension at mm -hmm. the top in squats, whereas powerlifting coaches won't. So there will be an element of their looking for the transfer from the gym. I don't know whether that transfer exists. I mean, just improving strength to a certain point will probably transfer if you're a beginner or you have low strength levels. Yeah. But past a certain point, it seems to fulfill a def very different need. So if we take um, how the tendons adapt to sprint contacts, when you do a lot of sprint or running contacts, most people run into overuse injuries, tendinopathies, et cetera. Yeah. When you get under a heavy load, what you get in the tendon is like the opposite. It doesn't stiffen up. You get a stress relaxation, tendon creep, and you get a nice even load across that whole tendon. Remodeling can take place. So that's why that, that's another reason like that's kind of like an antidote to the speed work you've done, which is what people don't really see lifting as. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why that that volume changes when you get close to competition. So you want the tendons maybe to be a little bit stiffer. So that's a kind of new, that's more recent, that research that's coming out about tendons and how they react to heavy load. And so people are now looking at how sprint programs are set up and how people often lift straight after running in a lot of good sprint programs. And it's like the concept behind it, often the concept isn't explained because it's something that's been found out through experience with the coaches that used it. Pat Roger family, how's it going? We talk about sleep all the time on this podcast. That's why we were partnered with Eight Sleep Mattresses. Now, this mattress is the Tesla of sleep. It's the Tesla of beds. Its technology tracks your heart rate, your heart rate variability. It changes its own temperature based off the way you sleep so that you get better sleep every single night. It is quite literally insane. Check them out. Andrew, how do they get it? Yes, and before I do that, I wanted to let you guys know that you can actually set the bed to wake you up silently. I know that sounds weird, but actually the bed starts vibrating around your head and it doesn't wake up the entire house hold the way my phone used to do back in the day. So now I just kind of have the bed wake me up silently and it's amazing. You guys got to head over to 8sleep.com slash power project. That's E-I-G-H-T sleep.com slash power project. When you guys go there, you'll see a banner across the top saying that you're going to receive $150 off automatically. So again, that's 8sleep.com slash power project to receive $150 off your pod pro cover or your pod pro cover and mattress combo. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Let's get back to the podcast. This worked well for my guys, and that's what's taken on. It's handed down to the next coach. But that's where what's cool is when science kind of comes in and can confirm that for you. 
So yeah, I think it's really the um, it's the recipe and how you put it together. It's like if you do like old block periodization and we're just going to do strength for eight weeks. Yeah, I'll almost certainly have some postural changes and you're going to get into trouble when you try and transition to sprinting. A lot of people, it tends to be more of a concurrent approach nowadays. You still keep speeding for the start. The emphasis of the block might be slightly different, but all the elements are in there to some degree. Mm -hmm. So quick question about that. You mentioned doing the lifting after the sprinting session. So the intention of the lifting is to loosen up, potentially loosen up and lengthen the ligaments because they were so stiff within the sprint training session? The tendons, yeah. So I don't, that's not the intent at this point, for, I believe, from most coaches. Yeah. A lot of coaches... Um, but that's an effect. I think that's an effect, and I think it's an effect that hasn't been really thought about, and it's more uh, mm. researchers and physiotherapists that are seeing that effect now and why they're prescribing heavy leg press or squat for distance runners after they do their interval reps mm -hmm. um, to try and help the tendons. So I don't think it Almost was... Almost a way to decompress in a way. Yeah, yeah. Which doesn't sound yeah, right, but yeah. Yeah, so like posturally, it's almost different because maybe the um, the running itself is quite expansive, so you can afford some compression afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more, I think, the effect at the tendon itself. And I don't think it was the intent behind it. I think most time it's coupled because Charlie Francis came out with a high-low idea, or at least mm -hmm. a lot of coaches put their high-intensity elements on one day because the CNS needed a little bit longer to recover. And evidence is changing around that as well. Some people can have more frequency. Some people can do this high intensity stuff every day. Yeah. But that was really, I think that really shaped a lot of um, training thought processes behind a lot of sprint coaches, like Charlie's book back whenever it came out, when he first introduced the high low concept. Mm -hmm. I think that really drove coaching practice in speed. And so that's why they were coupled more than more than anything. And then a lot of the time, I think from what I've heard from some collegiate coaches was just like gym time, available gym time. Mm. It's like, well, the footballer in tomorrow, football team are in like, you better get in and lift. Mm -hmm. right, we better rush in after track practice, power clean and squat, and we're out of there. We'll do conditioning next day. I think Ben Johnson, wouldn't he lift before he ran too? I've like, heard, I think heavier lifts before he ran. I don't remember, but I thought that's what it was. Yeah, I've, I've heard so many different yeah, things knows? here, which is crazy. Like I've heard, I heard Charlie say it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, well, certainly through the forum. I didn't actually right, speak right. to him my, myself. Right, right, right. Um, I've heard other coaches say, yeah, it did. I've heard coaches say they definitely saw Valerie Bors off the Russian mm -hmm. squatting before, before running. Um, like I said, I know I've seen Swiss athletes squat the day before um, doing pushing and bobsleigh. I know that um, Kaylee Humphreys, who's like, she's the most successful female bobsledder of all time. Yeah. She would at one point power clean, I think it was five hours before her competition. So they kind of worked out where her point was to get some potentiation in the mm. system. So rather than like what we think is a, of, of PAP, post-activation potentiation, which seems to occur anyway, anywhere from like three to eight minutes after a rep of squats, it's where the complex training stuff comes from when you jump in between your squats and stuff. It seems to be a bit different from that because it's like hours beforehand. Mm. And um, I remember asking Stu McMillan, her coach, like what he was doing with the activation stuff. And he was very much saying that it is very individual, you know. Mm -hmm. Some people have different, need different things. And I think Rana, uh, I might get his name wrong, Rana Raider with um, some of his group. Like if there's somebody, some people come in off a day of rest and they're flat, real flat. They need just some tension in the system. Some people are good. For the most part, elite athletes need a bit of something the day before they're going to compete at a very high intensity. So for him and his like, Stu McMillan will do a potentiation day on the Monday. So Tuesday is really good quality. Mm -hmm. And I've heard with um, Rainer um, that he, if he's got guys that get a little bit flat after a day's rest, he'll just do like a work capacity day on the first day. So they get something in the system, but they still get like a training effect, a work capacity training effect. So yeah. That's a bit of a long-winded answer there, but yeah, some people will benefit from strength training first to really activate the system. Mm. Some people are not good. It tends to be, I think the more bouncy elastic people, probably not so much. People are real force guys, and you see that spectrum within sprinters as well. Yeah. Um, you have this spectrum that's talked about. It's kind of like, um, yeah, strength sprinters or elastic sprinters. It's like guys that want to just use ground contact and guys that want to pull off the floor and use just elastic contacts. It's hard not to get caught up in like what somebody does, you know, uh, Ben Johnson, Charlie Francis, they like, 
change sprinting forever, uh, even though uh, Ben Johnson, you know, was uh, caught with steroids or whatever. He, they found Winstrol in his system or whatever the hell happened there. Um, they still changed uh, the way that people thought about sprinting for many, many decades after. Um, and then even in like your case, like scouring the internet, looking at different people um, and coming across your page and watching you jump. It's like, well, I want to learn about like what that guy does, but you might like you might, or anybody else might, um, they might do something uh, despite themselves. Like they could have a horrible training program. Hey, how's it? Sorry. I'm not going to whisper. <laughs> I know you guys are enjoying this content and we love talking to all these people and bringing you guys great information. So if you could help us out by hitting the like button, because that helps the algorithm subscribe and hit the notification bell, we're going to continue reaching more people and we're going to continue helping more people. Talk to y'all later.